This is how you write delicious D&D villains. A good villain can make your campaign epic and memorable. A bad one can make it feel pointless and lame. You don't want that, and I'm gonna show you how not to do that. For years, I've been learning how to craft compelling and enticing three-dimensional villains. Ones that will entice your players and make beating them memorable and impactful and important. Throughout the years, I've been tinkering with my villains and learning various different villain writing techniques. But stick around till the end of the video where I reveal to you a mind-blowing realization I came to in applying all of these techniques to tabletop RPG villains specifically. Welcome creators, I am Holistic Dungeon Master and I help DMs master their craft. If you're enjoying my content so far, then like the video, crit the subscribe button and notification bell because it really helps out the channel. Now let's get rolling! My big bad evil guys, my villains, sucked. They did. Let me tell you a story about the first one I ever ran. Unsurprisingly, it was Neznar, the black spider from Lost Minds of Fandever. By the way, spoilers for that module. If you haven't read it or played it already, skip ahead to this timestamp here. To be fair, the beginner module is pretty good. It's pretty great. It's well written. It doesn't do anything fancy or overwhelming for new DMs or players in the pod. It's okay. It's all good. But the black spider villain, Neznar, is lame. He sucks. He does. Sure, he was a kind of powerful and unscrupulous mage, but it doesn't really go much deeper than Drow Mage Bad, Want Powerful Relic, Has Two Gangs of Minions, and that's kind of it. Module doesn't really give us anything else, it gives us little to work with, and that was probably honestly the point. The designers wanted us DMs to come up with our own version of the Black Spider, but the problem is it's designed for not just beginner players, but beginner dungeon masters. DMs that would probably know very little about writing a good villain. So the results were as a Expected. The party felt very little threat from him. They didn't feel much more than vaguely annoyed when the black spider got in their way, and when they finally beat him, they didn't much care other than the fact that they got his sweet staff. That is a really sick staff, by the way. It costs a lot of gold, too. If you're at level 5 party decide to sell it, they're gonna get a lot of gold. And sure, I can sit here in front of you guys and blame the module. I can say, oh well, why weren't there at least a few bullet points on making Neznar a compelling villain? Why wasn't there that? I could do that. But the fact is, it's a knowledge issue. I just didn't know what made some of my favorite villains so good, why I cared about them, why I thought they were so cool, and so I didn't know how to make my own villains like that. But after this anticlimactic experience with the Black Spider, I knew that I had to up my game in a big way. So I did. Before I ran my next module, I researched exactly why good villains are so devilishly evil and fun. I learned how writers craft them in such a way that the audience just really resonates with them and loves to hate them. Each time I've run a villain, I've iterated and improved and added at least one of these techniques, and now, after years of doing so, I can confidently say that my villains are delicious. I'm going to show you exactly how I've taken all of these villain writing techniques, altered them and changed them to better suit tabletop RPG BBEGs, and I'm going to let you in on something incredibly powerful that I've came to realize in the process that breaks all the rules. Which, by the way, I reveal at the end of the video. Gotta earn it. Gotta earn that. But first, we have to think about our villain's code of ethics. Chaotic evil is a thing in D&D, but here's the thing, it's boring as hell. It can be fun, don't get me wrong, it suits certain types of bad guys and monsters, but really, we should avoid this with our BBEGs, for the most part. Our villains need to have a structure to their evil deeds. Things they won't do, lines they won't cross, and reasons they do the things they do. Why bother? Well, because it shows our players that there is a method to our villains' madness, and that makes them instantly more relatable. Yes. We want our players to relate to the person or thing that's doing terrible things to them. Our players need to understand that the villain fully, fully believes that what they're doing is the right thing. That they are the hero of their own story. Even in real life, those horrible people from our past, they really, really thought with conviction that what they were doing was the right thing. Again, why go through all the trouble? Don't our players just want to beat the bad guys, get the loot, and save the world? Yes, but it needs to feel like it means something. Otherwise, it's just gonna feel like an empty win. I'll explain that a little deeper later on in the video, but to really give this thing context, let's explore how our villains came to be villains.
Apart from the player characters, the villain is the most important character. Certainly the most important NPC. And if you're not making this so, then you're kind of missing the point. Villains drive the plot. that They are almost as important to the game and the story as our players. So we should give them a backstory just like our player characters have. As long as we aren't running a totally chaotically evil, big bad evil guy, then they didn't fall out of the womb with a curly mustache and a maniacal laugh. They just... They just didn't, right? They are who they are now because they lost their way. Their journey took them to where they are now. From where they started, they were probably trying to achieve something great and do something good. So we should map out that journey. What brought them from there? What their goal was? What took them off that good path and into an evil one? And we should slowly reveal that to our players. Yeah, it's a bunch of work and who cares, they're just gonna kill this person anyway, right? But what sounds more interesting? A thieves guild boss who does awful things just cause, you know, just cause he's super into killing and robbing people. Or a young man who fell into a wrong crowd just so he could drag his family out of poverty, had to do some bad stuff to raise himself out of the gutter and higher in the organization to such a level that in order to survive he had to do extreme and brutal things just to stay ahead of the backstabbing and finally rise to the top. And now he's at the top, he has to continue doing terrible things just to stay there, just to survive or he'll be killed and in the process. The things that he does now, those terrible things are now mundane and easy. Just another item on the agenda to stay ahead and increase his influence. Maybe he succeeded in giving his family that life of luxury he always wanted to give them, but they rejected it after learning about what he has become. Maybe some of the things he did inadvertently hurt or killed them. Instantly, instantly more interesting and relatable. I mean, come on, who doesn't want better for themselves and their families? Almost everyone, right? And so what happens then if we give them a reason they do the things they do and a relatable, maybe even tragic backstory? When the party beats them, they're going to care a lot, a lot more. It's going to mean something and it's going to have impact. But whoa, 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 just, just, just hold on a second there, chief. Hold your horses, stall, as we say in Ireland the ball. We're getting ahead of ourselves. Just a tiny little bit, but we're skipping right to the end, and that's not how a story is supposed to be told now, is it? So let's start where most stories do, at the beginning. Just a quick intermission. Down in the description, you'll find a link to my Patreon if you want to support the channel. You'll find a link to the HDM community Discord server, meet other DMs, play games with us, it's all happening in there, join the fun. The link to my free archetypal NPC handout, sign up to the mailing list, you'll get that completely for free. Every week I write a brand new encounter prompt in the form of short stories, so sign up for that to take advantage. Alrighty, back to the video. When I say give your villains a terrible introduction, I don't mean terrible as in a bad or a lame one, I mean it like the way the dictionary means it. Terrible, causing or likely to cause terror. Sinister. It should be a terrible moment for our party as our villain is introduced. Our villain needs to cause terrorster, terrorster? Terror? They need to cause terror and feel sinister. The very first moment they walk on stage in your game. Again, it's important for a big bad evil guy to have impact and first impressions after all are everything. So we need to drive home just how dangerous and threatening they are right from the get-go. Let me tell you how I introduced one of my most recent villains, Sneedle. I wasn't thinking of Severus Snape when I wrote the description, physical description for this character, but in retrospect, <laughs> I described him just like this guy. So yeah, take from that what you will. But he was nothing like Snape. When the party met him, he was, ostensibly, the assistant to a brave and heroic Tomb Raider, Dash Kleptocrypt. Cowering and seemingly meek, he did whatever this brave, intrepid explorer said. When Dash waltzed fearlessly into the mouth of the temple entrance, he was immediately smashed to jam and jelly by a booby trap. Sneedly tagged along with the party as they explored deeply, seemingly too terrified to be left alone in the jungles around the temple. The two. The Tomb Temple. It was both. But as they reached the inner chamber where the MacGuffin stood glowing, Sneedly Misty stepped right up to it, triggering ancient monstrous guardians to come to life and descend upon the party. He promptly opened a portal and sneered at them for being as stupid as the lunk he convinced to come here who had served his purpose by triggering the trap at the entrance. He grabbed the MacGuffin, walked through the portal, and left the party to be ripped apart by ancient terrors. BAM! Not only did this villain subvert their expectations, he also, he also left them with a burning desire for revenge against him. They really, really hated this guy, especially one player 
in particular. Ah, he tricked us. He took the MacGuffin and he left us for dead. Well, you can see why they, they really wanted revenge. They immediately took up his trade. Why? Because Sneedley had a huge impact on them. They wanted to find him and beat him. They did find him. They managed to catch up with him. They met Sneedley again, but when they did, they learned something about him that ties beautifully, very, very nicely into the next segment of the video. Our villains need to be a challenge worthy of our party. When I ran Neznar for the first time, remember that guy? My party absolutely steamrolled him. Now that was my fault, it was. I had no idea how to run a magic user in combat at the time. I was an extremely new DM, but it was extremely anticlimactic. Defeating the, oh, the black spider, this mysterious figure whose web stretches far and wide and who's trying to beat them to the last forge of souls went down in round two. Lame, that was so lame, it immediately took the teeth out of this character. As a result, beating him was just not gratifying for my players. So we need to make sure that they are a challenge for the party. Either in combat, intellectually, ideally both. Why bother? Again, let's ask why bother? Well, why is it such a good feeling finally beating a difficult boss in Dark Souls. We want our players to feel that when they inevitably, come on, let's be honest, beat the bad guy, that they earned it. Otherwise it just becomes meaningless. Look, let's return to Sneedley for a second. The first time they met him, he proved himself a worthy adversary intellectually by tricking them, grabbing the MacGuffin, and leaving them all to die. The next time they met him, they tried to murderize him. They really, really wanted to kill him at level two. They didn't know was that he was an Archmage. He kind of colded half the party into oblivion, into a consciousness, and they were all kind of taken prisoner. When that happened, it was a real uh-oh moment. They understood immediately that they poked the wrong bear. They learned that this is someone that they need to get smart about beating, or they just need to get more powerful. This villain is going to be a mountain to overcome. And more, and most importantly, it reinforced just how badly they wanted to put an end to him. They finally did, by the way, after many, many more close calls and semi-defeats and, you know, fighting him at half power, causing him to retreat and stuff. They finally had that final battle where they were both on equal footing and they came out on top. That was a truly, truly special moment for me and my group in that particular campaign. And they really, really, really liked getting revenge on Sneedley. They did, of course they did. But we're not going deep enough. Defeating him was not only extremely gratifying and gave a massive sense of accomplishment because he beat them and made fun of them a few times. No, no, no. You see, their beef with Sneedley was deeply personal. And your player's beef with your villains needs to be too. How much better will your players feel if the villain they defeat had hurt them personally? If they or the ones they loved became caught up in their cruel and callous actions? What if your player's backstory is tragic because of your villain? And the villain reveals this to them mid-confrontation. Wow, now things are really heating up. Now the stakes are even higher and with revenge thrown into the mix, it's a beautiful gumbo of action and suspense and drama. Now things are purse. We are deepening the impact of that moment where they beat the bad guy even further. My boy Severus Sneedley, for example, was personally responsible for one player's hometown being turned into a bugbear infested illicit substance refinery ran by an amoral industrialist. Even as he was dying during that final epic encounter between them, he taunted another player by mentioning that he knows where her missing family is and that they work for him now. Now he is dead, but he is still impacting their lives and their loved ones. He continues to haunt them from beyond the grave. See how the players become infinitely more invested in Sneedley and what he's been getting up to behind the scenes. See how much now that they begin to care about this villain. Not care in a lovely dovey way, just care about him and his actions. That he has an effect on them. By finding ways to thread our villain's foul deeds through our player backstories, we add another dimension. Stacking those dimensions on our villain. Stacking them all up, not only to this character, this villain, but to our entire narrative, our entire story. But of course, Defeating and getting revenge on a villain written like this is immediately satisfying, yes, but that feeling quickly fades and all that's left once it's all gone, once the heat and steam of revenge has been cooled, one burning question remains. Why? Why did they do this? What was the reason? Why did they come to be this horrid villain? Well, we better give them those answers. I can't reveal here why Sneedley did anything. We're still in the middle of that campaign as I'm recording this video, and I don't want to spoil anything for my wonderful players who I know watch these videos. I see you. 
Much love, game. But we can give our villains a huge boost by thinking outside the box for why they've done what they've done. Can't reveal Sneedley's why, but let's use a much, 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 infinitely much better writer's villain for an example. Who else but Brandon Sanderson? One of my favorite authors, spoilers from this point on for the entire Mistborn trilogy, kind of. Well, mainly the first book, but anyway, skip here to avoid all of that to still get the gist of my message. They gone? Cool. All right. The real crew be left, let's talk this out. The Lord Ruler is the main villain of the first book. An almost godlike figure with impossible powers and hordes of deadly minions. He has done terrible things not only to the people in this story, but to the world they live in. He is an absolutely and entirely unforgivable figure. Right up until he is defeated, that is. <laughs> when he is, he reveals that he has done what he did because it was the lesser of evils. Now that he is about to be dead and gone, an even greater threat that he was holding back is going to be unleashed on the world. Hot damn, that's that's a good why. It, it actually al it almost turns him into a good guy. Almost. He has sacrificed his humanity, his very soul, doing these terrible things he really didn't want to, but he had to. The alternative is much, much worse. The point of all this? Well, there's two. And hopefully, uh, hopefully you're starting to see a little pattern here with all of these techniques. I'm sure some of you clever clogs are. It serves to increase the impact of this villain by both giving him, one, an extra dimension to his character, and two, humanizing him to the reader. In an or case, that would be our party. And there you go. All of these techniques ultimately serve either one or both of these purposes. When we do this with our villains, that final moment between our party and the bad guys won't be anticlimactic, unremarkable, and kind of lame like my first version of Neznar. Instead, it will be satisfying and meaningful and memorable and even a little sad if we humanize them really, really well. And it will get the party just asking themselves questions about the whole narrative, morality, should we have even killed this? Sometimes, are we the bad guys? Were they the good guys? There's infinite possibility for complexity if we write our villains well. It all works together holistically. Of course, name of the channel. It's all beautiful, it's all cozy, and it all fits well together, yes, 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 but it's a big but. Everything, all of it, all of it, ne nearly all of it, can be trumped by one simple thing. One singular aspect of our villain that if we really nail it, it makes most of those other things I just mentioned, most of those techniques fall to the wayside and become almost completely obsolete. It breaks all the rules. One thing that transforms our villains into delicious villains. If you can make your villain fun, then you don't need them to have a moral code. They don't need to have a relatable backstory or be involved in our players' backstories. They don't need a why. Why? Well, if their specific brand of evil is pulled off in a unique, novel, or interesting way, then none of that really matters. The acts of evil are the impact of our villain in this case. They can be the whole point. Let me give you a prime example. The Joker. Classic villain. My favorite villain of all time. I, it might be kind of basic to say so. I'm sure he's probably the favorite villain of a lot. A lot of you watching too. But why? Right? All of those things I've been talking about, all of those techniques, they make sense. You know, the backstory, the relatability, blah, 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 blah. All of that serves to increase our villain's impact. But why then, if the Joker doesn't have any of that stuff, why does he have an impact? Why does he resonate so well with us? Why do we remember him? Why is he such a classic, timeless villain? He doesn't have a reason for his chaos and murder. He doesn't have a well-refined why, he doesn't have a relatable backstory, and he's not involved in Batman's backstory. But his over-the-top acts of violence and mayhem are pure, pure spectacle. He's an intelligent homicidal maniac who does these things because he finds them funny, and he tries to inject his own personal brand of humor into these acts, and the juxtaposition is wonderful. It's delicious. Just that one thing is good enough to transfix many of us on this villain. Like I said, he's a classic and we all love when he's on screen or in the comic panel because we can't wait to see what he'll do next. That's the point, that's the impact. If you can come up with a premise for your villain's evil that is as unique and as novel and surprising and funny or whatever as this, then you don't need to think about the other stuff. It makes the relatable humanizing element unnecessary in the fun of your villain's evil. Well, it should include the terrible introduction. Their brand of evil will naturally showcase their worthiness as an opponent, as an adversary. Wouldn't be fun or novel otherwise. However, I'd just hate myself if I didn't mention this. Of course, there are some versions of the Joker that have a little bit of everything. In Joker, you know, the one with walking, walk, 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 Joaquin? I don't know how to say his name. This guy, in this movie, we saw a relatable backstory and a compelling why. Why Fleck became the Joker. The world failed him time and time again, so he lashed back out at the world. I'm sure we can all understand and relate to that 
especially in these times. <laughs> in the 1989 Batman movie, Jack Nicholson, one of the greatest actors of all time, played the Joker and, well, spoiler alert by the way for an almost 40 year old movie, this version of the Joker was the one who shot Bruce Wayne's parents. What a twist, back when he was just Jack the mobster. If you can include everything we said on this list and make your villain so fun that it doesn't need any of it, then your villain will be remembered by your parties for years to come, maybe even their entire entire lives, because the best villains we all know and love, the ones that truly stand the test of time, are all written like this. So write yours the same way. Write them deliciously. If you've watched this video up until now, then thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. Don't forget to like the video, share it with someone else who needs to supercharge their villains, crit the subscribe button and notification bell. And remember, this world needs good DMs and villains. <laughs>